and then what? Black and what? Blasphemous murderers, blood crazed fiends. Atonement for the wretches by the wrath of Mother Cos. Is that you, Lady Maria? No. You're someone else. I have failed. Please, Lady Maria. Since the release of Bloodborne the Old Hunters, there's been a sizable debate on one of the most memorable and pivotal characters, Lady Maria. Who was she exactly? Was she a righteous hunter? A cold-blooded killer? A duty-bound scholar? Or a kind-hearted caretaker? Although we're first introduced to her in the research hall, echoes of who she was have resonated all throughout the game. The first glimpse we encounter of her could arguably be the moment that we first awaken into the hunter's dream. Ah, you found yourself a hunter. I am a doll, here in this dream to look after you, pursue the echoes of blood, and I will channel them into your strength. And I will be here for you, to embolden your sickly spirit. Unbeknownst to us at the time, the doll is one primary character's vision of who Maria was, that person being the first hunter, German. Among the first hunters, all students of German, was the lady hunter Maria. This was her hunter's garb, crafted in Canehurst. Maria is distantly related to the undead queen, but had great admiration for Gehrman, unaware of his curious mania. Before the release of the Old Hunter's expansion, there was heated speculation over who Gehrman's apprentice was. Maria's attire description makes it clear that she is, in fact, one of the very first hunters and studied directly with Gehrman's tutelage. Not only that, but that he harbored a curious mania for her. This brings us to the real hunter's workshop and Maria's connection with the doll. The doll clothes read, A deep love for the doll can be surmised by the fine craftsmanship of this article and the care with which it was kept. It borderlines on mania and exudes a slight warmth. A key phrase here is the use of mania, both in Gehrman's feelings for Maria and the meticulous nature in which the doll was made and her clothing was kept. He loved her, arguably to the point of obsession, yet she never outwardly realized this in the time that they spent together. In his overwhelming grief, Garman arranged for the doll to be made in the waking world. What he very likely did not intend was that in his desire to breathe life into her, she came alive when he, Lawrence, and their associates appealed to the moon presence and created the hunter's dream. She came alive with the vision of Maria that the first hunter perceived, the gentle, compassionate woman he saw, very much how women are interpreted in reality, he only captured one trait of what made her who she was as a person. In all his times with her, seeing her grow as a determined scholar and formidable fighter, he failed to see her in her entirety. In his mind, she became a caricature. Because of his limited interaction with the doll in the dream, I feel that he came to realize this, albeit too late. According to the item descriptions involving the Great Ones or deities of Bloodborne, they're sympathetic in nature and often answer when called upon. Speculatively, Garman could have very likely agreed to enter the dream as long as he could be reunited with the one he loved. When he came to face his vision that he had of her, he discovered that the vision of gentle femininity he envisioned was merely a product of his own perception. In the hunter's workshop where Garman, Maria, and the first hunters spent their time in secret, we find the old hunter's bone by the grave that leads us to the hunter's nightmare. The bone of an old hunter whose name is lost. It is said that he was an apprentice to old Garman, and a practitioner of the art of quickening, a technique particular to the first hunters. It is most appropriate that hunters, carriers of the torch who are sustained by the dream, would tease an old art from its remains. Although speculative, it's likely that this bone belonged to Maria herself, a direct apprentice of Garman, whose name has been forgotten over time. Outside of the nightmare, do we ever hear her name spoken? No, we only feel the presence that she left behind in the image of the doll and the influential design of her clothing. We often see the doll drawn here, praying and showing a rare glimpse of emotion and what appears to be sincere care for the good hunter. Looking at the doll's dress and Maria's attire side by side, the overall design and color scheme are related. 
the use of deep taupe on both of their capes, the black of Maria's frock coat and the dull skirt, the matching boots, the crimson of Maria's jabot, soaked in blood, is translated into the doll's matching tie. It isn't until we meet Maria herself that we realize the correlation. A corpse should be left well alone. Oh, I know very well how the secrets beckon so sweetly. Only an honest death will kill you now. Liberate you from your wild curiosity. Hearing her smooth voice and Slavic accent and seeing her beautiful face are the final ties. They are indeed the same as the dolls. The moment the good hunter ushers her to her rest, we visit the hunter's dream, where we have a curious interaction with the doll. Good hunter, this may sound strange, but have I somehow changed moments ago from some place, perhaps deep within? I sensed a liberation from heavy shackles, not that I would know. How passing strange. <laughs> she senses a tremendous weight has been lifted off her shoulders. Could a part of Maria's consciousness be within her as well? The first time we're made aware of Maria is in the research hall. We quickly learn that she's the guardian of the secret source of the nightmare. All we know of her at this point is that she's a solitary gatekeeper, and even Simon isn't aware of what she hides. Wandering around the halls is an eerie experience. We're faced with the patients that seem to have been left behind to wander, some attacking you and others serving as fodder for hunters stationed throughout the building. Here, we learn a new depth of heartbreaking truth surrounding the healing church. These patients were subject to dehumanizing experiments, and as soon as they were dubbed failures, quietly abandoned. Judging by the dialogue you hear, it appears that these people chose to become the church's subjects at will, but were then subjected over time to unspeakable agony. Lady Maria, Lady Maria, please take my hand. Please help me. Don't let me drown. In their darkest moments, there is one figure that stands out to give them respite, Lady Maria. She would have made her rounds, given comfort to the suffering, holding hands, talking to them, and making life more bearable. This struck me on a personal level. It's rare to see the presence of caretakers in horror or dystopian narrative. Maria's role as somebody who spent the last period of time in her life caring for the sick is notable, especially in the bleak world of Yarnum. The most striking information is shared by the Blood Saint Adeline, who shared what appeared to be the most intimate relationship with Lady Maria. She appeals to us to aid her on her quest for ascension, mistaking our footsteps initially for hers. Although at this point, her focus is to become something different than herself, as it seems was the Healing Church's mission with the research hall after all, but Maria came to her frequently, even going so far as giving her the key to the Lumen Flower Gardens outside. Take this charm. Lady Maria gave it to me, but it is all I can offer. At this point, however, she's too far gone to realize what it was that she was giving, calling it a charm. The item description reads, Key to the balcony on the first floor of the research hall. Lady Maria of the Astral Clock Tower gave this to the patient Adeline. Maria had hoped that Adeline would find comfort in the faint breeze that carried the scent of flowers from the outside, but Adeline couldn't fathom her intentions. A considerate gesture, the last two lines being the most interesting. Adeline couldn't fathom her intentions. Although purely speculation, it leads me to wonder if Maria had feelings for Adeline. Of all the patients she saw, she gave Adeline the freedom and the means to roam outside, to feel at ease with the scent of flowers, just as if she were to have given her a bouquet herself. As German had his eyes on her, she very well could have had interests on someone else that contributed in her keeping their relationship strictly cordial. 
The tragedy of it all is knowing that there was no possible way for a friendship or anything more to form in this desperate scenario. The further into the Healing Church's experiments Adeline went, the less human she became. Even so, Maria remained at her side. This decision that she made to abandon the hunter's life that she once reveled in was not taken lightly. Her hunter garb made it clear that she was once a noble of Castle Canehurst, a direct relative of the undead queen. The lady aspect of her name interests me most, as in many European cultures throughout history, lady was a title that was only used to address members of an aristocratic class. Although Maria blatantly rejects the blood and bombast that was common of Canehurst knights, her title suggests that she doesn't let you forget exactly who she is or where she comes from. In the castle, the paintings on the walls display both men and women dressed as knights. In addition, they live in a matriarchal society with a single queen upon the throne. We have little need of a consort. Such a path would be like lead to further ruin. With this in mind, Maria's decision to take the raiment of a hunter may not have been an unusual one. Her attire even states that her hunter gear was custom made in Canehurst as a one-of-a-kind piece. An interesting detail I found is that her hat is the earliest example of the popular hunter tricorn hat. Although her name was lost, her nostalgic sense of style must have left quite the impression on future generations of hunters. Overall, hers and the old hunter costume designs are based on clothing from the 18th century, whereas in present day Yarnum, the clothing is inspired by 19th century Victorian design by and large. This could even be a subtle indication of how much time has gone by since the time of the old hunters. As it was a knight's duty to dispose of beastly threats, so was hers as she immigrated into Yarnum to learn under Garman's tutelage and join the hunt. Since she was involved with the caretaking of the patients in the research hall at the time, we could even go so far as to assume that in the past, the Healing Church and Canehurst could have been either on friendly or neutral terms, although by now the church and the surviving people of Canehurst have become bitter enemies. When we find her in the astral clock tower, she's slumped over in her chair, a smashed photo and pewter goblet beside her. Although the picture is impossible to make out, it sends an unsettling message that remorse is what fills her memory, so much so that she'd rather smash it all away than to face it any longer. The goblet beside it drowned the sorrow. Whether this is blood or wine is up for debate, Canehurst nobles are known to have imbibed blood, but if this were the case with her, we see that she's given in to her thirst. In either case, the way that she's found, in a pool of blood, and these items behind her, strongly hint that in the end, she made the tragic decision to end her own life. The moment we awaken her, we learn exactly how formidable she is with her striking fighting style. We begin in a frenzy of expert swordsmanship, the product of high-level skill that she learned from Garman. As we progress, however, we learn exactly how resolved she becomes to protect the secrets beyond the clock tower. She plunges her blades into her own chest in an image of seppuku before bursting into a whirlwind of blood and flame. According to the description of her beloved sword, this is an aspect of Canehurst combat she detested. Hunter weapon wielded by Lady Maria of the Astral Clock Tower. A trick sword originated in the same country as the Canehurst Chikage, only this sword feeds not off blood, but instead it demands great dexterity. Lady Maria was fond of this aspect of the Rakuyo, as she frowned upon blood blades, despite being a distant relative of the Queen. One day, she abandoned her beloved Rakuyo, casting it into a dark well when she could stomach its presence no longer. In spite of this, she reached deep inside herself to draw out that incredible power she had concealed for so long. The result is spectacular. It took a great deal of desperation for her to become willing to call upon what had laid dormant inside of her. Even still, when she has you staggered and at your weakest, of all the things she can possibly do, she pulls you into an embrace. Once we put Maria to her final rest, we stroll into the fishing village, a damp, barnacle-eaten visage of decay. This is the secret she had fought long and hard to conceal. We meet the fishing hamlet priest, who hobbles about, muttering dark rhymes of Bergenworth's murderous crimes. In his chant, he appeals to the Great One, Koss. When you don the milkweed rune and listen to the surrounding houses, they too chant and appeal to the gods. At the very end of the village, we see what they're alluding to. Koss herself, a deity to them, lies dead on the beach. 
It's up for debate as to whether the Bergenware scholars murdered her or desecrated her corpse, but what they did was a deeply heretical act, causing the orphan, a great one in a fetal state, to never be born. When Maria says, a corpse should be left well alone, she refers not only to herself, but what was done to Koss. They didn't stop there. In their wake, the villagers were brutalized. When you follow the priest down his water-trodden path, he gives you the accursed brew, which reads, Skull of a local from the violated fishing village. The inside of the skull was forcibly searched for eyes, as evidenced by innumerable scratches and indentations. No wonder the skull became stewed in curses. They who offer baneful chants, weep with them as one in trance. As a result of this atrocity, the villagers chant to their gods. In Bloodborne, the Great Ones are sympathetic in nature and come when called upon. With this in consideration, I believe that the villagers created the Hunter's Nightmare themselves. They prayed for the suffering of generations of hunters, and their gods answered their wishes. Even as we're whisked off into the nightmare, a chant is the first thing you hear. Cursed the fiends, their children too. And their children forever true. Although it's been believed that Garman and Maria were at the forefront of the violation of the fishing hamlet, the priest's speech leads me to believe that several of the early scholars of Bergenworth were involved, principally Lawrence, Ludwig, Garman, and Maria, among others. These four characters are key in the narrative, and Garman has suggested ties to the Orphan of Koss. When you finally slay the abandoned Orphan of Koss, Garman no longer struggles in his sleep when you return to the dream. Oh, good hunter, I can hear German sleeping. On any other night, he'd be restless, but on this night, he sounds so very calm. Perhaps something has eased his suffering. In the old hunters, the bosses are closely interconnected. All of them are among the first hunters and scholars of Bergenworth that broke free from their institution of learning and took different paths. Lawrence lost his humanity and has become a cleric beast in the flaming motif of a crucified martyr. For Ludwig, only the faintest hint of his humanity remains, regaining it briefly upon realizing that his holy blade has been with him all along in his final dialogue upon defeating him. Although these two characters, as well as Garman, show little remorse for their actions, it's clear that they're living with the horrific consequences. In this respect, Maria's tale is unique. She alone shows true regret and a deep desire to spend the rest of her life doing everything she can to atone. Lady Maria shows that a strong and formidable woman can also be nurturing and kind. She's an example that in spite of past mistakes, it's possible to turn a new leap and go forward in life. Even though she did not survive her deep sorrow and regret, she stands as one who was able to grasp the pain that she had and channel it into her atonement to bring light and to ease the suffering of those who had nobody else to turn to.